Hey everyone, it is George Kuros, and I am excited to be able to talk to you today and uh, welcome you to another highlight reel um, from August of 2022 uh, for the Innovators Mindset podcast. And sometimes I decide to do an intro and sometimes I don't, but today was one of those days I wanted to. And uh, I think part of the reason is because, you know, people are going back to school, right? And you're either been in school for a few weeks, you might be just starting as you, you enter the year. And I was thinking about something that uh, was said to me uh, just recently, and we were having a conversation uh, with a group of administrators. And part of it was, uh, hey, we're, our, our, our team, our, our schools, our, our staff, they, they, the last thing they want to be told is to remember why they do what they do. And I, I've seen people talk about this, like, don't, you know, don't tell us to tell, you know, to remember our why and stuff like that. And I, and I, I get it, right. I, I get, you know, people are frustrated and stuff like that, but I like, I've been thinking about it and I always try to just kind of, you know, think about things instead of just kind of get caught up in stuff. Really kind of think like, why, why would people say that? And I think that it's, it is actually really important to remember why you do what you do. And I think it's also important to stand firm to it. But as leadership teams, as you know, a staff, we have to make sure that we don't do everything to extinguish the flame. The reason why we're doing this, one of the reasons I talk about the idea of learner-driven evidence-informed practice and why I hate the term data-driven is because I do not know a teacher who went into education because they wanted to test kids all day and wanted to focus on tests. And, you know, um, you'll hear this, especially in the US, people will say like, oh, like, we live in this testing culture, you know, the state is making us test. And I always ask this question, is the is the state making you test a ton? Or is your school district making you practice tests? So you can take the state test? Because those are two different things, right? And I think that for me, I'm very adamant about why I do what I do, and what my purpose is. And I hold true to it. And when I feel that something is getting in the way, I, I, I make sure I say something. And so I, it's not about not remembering why we do. I think it's, that's more important than ever. I think it's actually challenging when things are getting in the way of why we do what we do and saying like, hey, this is not why I do this work today. And so I think it's like, I think important for me is that we ask questions of, you know, maybe um, the administrators, the, the districts, are working and saying like, Hey, I became an educator because of this, but here's all these extra things that do they, are they really necessary? Are we doing this? And is this getting my way? And I, I thought about this. I saw a tweet that said something along the lines. And honestly, I just saw it in passing and I like, I don't want to take credit um, for this, because, but I can't find it. I looked all over today before, but I thought it was such a really valuable message. It is not about not remembering our why or you know what our compelling reason is what the things we do it is ensuring that we do everything in our power to to fan the flame not extinguish it from our staff from our students you know from the from the people we serve and not getting that way so i just i was just thinking about that because a lot of times we can get in the way of people's purpose and I think for me, when we talk to people, when we are trying to lead, you want them to be more excited. You want them to really feel purpose in their work that they're doing. And sometimes you can get away and get in the way of that purpose. I felt when I was like most disengaged from what I was doing in education, I felt that it was because I was often saying like, this is not what I signed up to do. This is not why. And then you, and then you do lose your reasoning, you forget what your purpose is. And so to all those out there listening, it's not about remembering, forget or forgetting or remembering your why. It's to ensure that we help people find their purpose and not get in that way. And so I'm just kind of blabbing now, but I just was thinking about that, you know, that conversation. And I think that's just really, you know, especially in leadership, that's, that's why we do. We want people really excited about their work. And sometimes we do things that kind of get in that way. So I just leave you with those thoughts um, as you go into the rest of the podcast. But thanks for listening. You're going to enjoy some really great guests. Welcome back to another episode of the Innovators Mindset Podcast.
So I got to ask you, um, you, you kind of just briefly talked about this. I want to just talk about your, uh, uh, you said something I've never heard of before. It, you talked about your book, five gen leadership mm -hmm. and said leading five generations of the schools in the 2020s. And you actually named a lot of generations that I heard of, but there was one I've never, this new, I've never heard of this before. And so can you just talk a little bit about the book and yeah. the five generations and what, what that's about? Yeah, that would be the new one's probably Gen Alpha, the, the, yeah. the kids in fourth and fifth grade and on down. Yeah. So I was leading this uh, training in South Texas and I do this generational exercise because I want I break people, the group up by generation because I want them to understand where they are in relation to their Gen Z and Gen Alpha students. Right. And so I, we have Gen Z teachers now. A lot of people don't understand that Gen Zers, the ones up to 25 or 26, are now in our teaching staff. They're not all just millennials. These right. are Gen Z. And so I have these three Gen Z teachers. And I said, hey, if you could change professional development, what would you change? About 50 people in the room, they're all looking at these three babes in the woods teachers, right? Yeah, right. And this one teacher bravely says, sometimes I wish that the trainers would just leave us alone and let us go figure it out. Right. And that struck me. It was an epiphany for me because I've worked, I've been in several thousand classrooms the last five years. And I kept picking up on something in my training about the younger teachers. This is the figure it out generation. Mm -hmm. And they've been figuring it out their whole lives from their apps to their surfing to the games they play. They don't read directions. They're right. not used to people telling them how to do things. They want to go figure it out on the far extreme or the baby boomers like me. Please tell me step by step. How do you want me to do this? What is it supposed to look like when I get through? Huh. And in between, you've got the Gen Xers and you've got the millennials who are sort of in between. The millennials are more like the Gen Z. The Xers are more like the boomers. And that's hmm. because the Xers and the boomers, the older people, grew up without the Internet. I call that the Internet Valley. And the millennials and the Gen Zers grew up surfing and seeing the whole world on their phones and computers and tablets. Mm -hmm. And they're bringing different views, different ways of doing things into the schools today, into the workforce today. You are a fantastic principal. I love that more than anything. And you understand children, you understand teachers, and you understand this whole thing about strengths, because you were talking about it even mm -hmm. here, strengths and passions of kids. And it is the most important thing. And the trouble is, I hope the parents will see through my book, wait a minute, I have to find the good parts of my kids. Right. They're so nervous that their children, there's something wrong with them that they don't stop and go, oh, well, oh yeah, he could put right. together a, a 10,000 piece spaceship from Lego. What? Mm -hmm. I right. mean, they don't think about that. And I think that's what I love about, well, it's probably because everything you say I like. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, so I like go. the book. I don't know. I, you know, I take notes on it all the time and I pull out things. But I think that's it. It's believing in these kids and trying to use their strengths and passions to teach them. And I know parents find it difficult because they're so, do you know, something just happened. Understood.org said the new statistics 48% of parents still think their kid will snap out of it. And 33% right. of teachers think children with, di with differences are lazy. Mm. I was so upset about those. And Ned Hallowell, when I told him about it, and he's a very famous uh, uh, author mm -hmm. also and a doctor with ADHD. And he just said to me, we have a lot of work to do. And we do, but I believe it's people like you writing books like this. Well, I appreciate and maybe that. my book too, that maybe will help the parents to say, wait a minute, let's get some help. Well, it's it's kind of like saying a kid, oh, a kid can't keep their attention, right? Like they and then you know, a quick diagnosis of ADHD. And I'm not talking doctoral stuff or anything like that, because I'm not that person. But then right. watching that kid play video games for eight hours, and it's like they can keep their attention. But maybe they and just anything they like, stuff. right? And so it's just kind of trying to figure that stuff out, right? So it is, and, it is looking for that, and I think that that's one of the things that Katie and I, uh, Katie Novak and I, who obviously co-wrote the book with me, um, we really focused on is actually that yeah, we want to develop where kids are struggling, and we want to do the same thing. But I think that as you mentioned earlier, the the notion of confidence, right? If kids come to school and we're always like, we need to fix this, we need to fix this, we need to fix this, and then we're like, why do they hate being? Here? It's like because you keep telling them they suck all day, and so of course they don't want to be there, right? And so I always say it's not about ignoring weaknesses; it's about starting with strengths. When you're kind of going through that process and you have like 
this is, it has to happen. I'm sure this people are going to be interested in your, in your answer to this. Right. And you have like a lot of par parental involvement and, mm -hmm. you know, you're, you know, probably in, in, in your situation, you know, parents are, I shouldn't say they're more active, but they're, you know, there, there is, there is a lot more kind of involvement at, at, a, at maybe in some, at some level. What happens when you have like conflicting ideals? like between parents, like, and yeah. here's the mission of the school. Here's, mm -hmm. you know, but this parent wants something totally different than that, you know, and they're, they're, you know, paying that process. Like wh how, what happens then? Like, what do you do? Oh, I'm like, We're in there's it. a lot of conflicting what? parent views right now. And like, you know, it's getting complicated. Most definitely. Um, I think you hit the nail on the head. So we have, you know, we've prided ourselves I mean, our school is about 30 years old. The whole time that the, the push has been around more innovative, inclusive education, mm -hmm. um, not because not to do it just to do it, but because the school has always believed that that was the best way for students to learn, mm -hmm. you know, having kind of Daniel Pinkish sort of mastery autonomy purpose over their right. learning and how might we do that in different ways. Uh, and design thinking was super important to us, you know, five to 10 years ago, as we kind of developed a lot of this too. So there's, if, you know, teachers that work in a school like this, I think feel like they're part of, they have a lot of uh, autonomy. There's a trial and error culture. And that's one of the things that's exciting. Students, I feel like generally speaking, kind of go with what the school is going with, you know, as long as you're right. tuned into their needs and listening to what they want, you know, it's, there's a good symbiotic relationship between teaching and learning and student experience in, in, in most schools, or at least in this school. And it takes a lot of work and it has to be purposefully done, but that's kind of the, that's the work, right? Like that's when you come to work every day, that's what you're kind of trying to achieve. Mm -hmm. Our parents in my particular context come from traditional learning, like very traditional right. learning environments in Korea, um, in Germany, in China, <laughs> Um, sometimes, you know, from other countries, but those are our kind of predominant kind of groups and they don't necessarily, I mean, in their, in their corporate lives, like that's one of the good connections is like in their corporate lives, mm -hmm. they are innovating. They understand what, you know, cultures of trial and error do. They understand how autonomy can lead to creativity and they get, they get it. Yeah. But then it's really easy for them to revert back to this idea of, well, I understand that you're doing project based learning or I understand that you've got, you know, this this um, X block is what we call it. It's kind of a genius hour on steroids thing. Yeah. I understand you've got you've got these things going, but, you know, where's the rigor? Right. And right, right. you're sort of thinking I have missed a step as an educational leader because I have not properly educated our parent yeah. community right. about, you know, what this is meant to be. So I think that's the key. And I, I mean, I, I'm, honestly, I'm not exaggerating. I was thinking about this this morning on my bike ride because we just did a, a community survey. Like every year we do a community survey and we were getting the results back and we expected it to be a little bit different due to COVID. We've had three different kind of lockdown moments and been in online learning and stuff. And we know that, you know, things are a little disconnected. And we also know that community for a private school an international school, the idea of community is like a value proposition. Like, right if you're thinking about spending all this money to put your kids in school, the community is something that we like to offer, but we haven't really been able to offer it because parents can't come onto campus pretty much all right. year. We haven't been able to have parents on campus. So when we got the results back, there is definitely a mismatch on, on some level between right. what we're trying to do and what we've been driving at and what our parents expect. And that is, I think it's a really cool opportunity mm -hmm. and to some extent it's expected, but I think it's a really cool opportunity because that's really where I think the rubber meets the road. If parents fully understand what we're doing and understand that we believe this is much more rigorous than, you know, drilling math problems. Right. And then they say, you know what? I disagree. I'm going to go to a different school. Like that is absolutely fine. Like school choice right. is a good thing, mm -hmm. but I don't want to lose students or parents from our community because they don't get it. You know what I mean? And I that's think great. that's the key. Yeah. Well, I, I think, I think, I, I think I, and I, I'll be first admit that sometimes, you know, I was at fault for this too. 
you talk about, like I'm saying you as in me, right? You talk about mm -hmm. the idea of like project-based learning, innovation, all these things that are really important and they're kind of where you're going to, but we don't talk about some of the boring, like foundational things that we, because that's not really exciting. It's just kind of like, that's just, you know, what we do Good to point. get to that point. And so then there is that mismatch because of what we, for, we tend to not focus on because I think a lot of people say like, hey, it's like, I can go to this school that focuses on the basics or I can focus on, uh, go to this right. school that focuses on innovation. They're like, well, no, this school is focusing on innovation through actually giving basic skills to get to that point. Yes. Not, it's not an either or, right? It's yeah, actually saying, like, how do we go be, how do we go beyond the basics? Not how do we neglect them? How do we go beyond? Yes. So I think that's a really important aspect. So I'm just going to ask you like a straight up question. Okay. Don't need a long answer. Was this year harder than the prior for your district? Did you find Absolutely. that or no? Okay, so that's been consistent. Okay, so we are recording this at the end of the 2021-22 school year, going into, and by the time people are listening to this, we're going into 22-23. Do you think this year will be better than the last? And if you do, why would you say that? And if you don't, like, what are, like, and maybe what are some of the things that we should be concerned about if we're going into it? Because I'm actually, like, it's kind of like, I, I guess I'm saying, please predict the future. That, I was about to say, I do not have a crystal ball. I cannot right. predict the future. But right, because like, if I would ask you, if I would ask you at the end of 2021, you're like, how could that get any worse, probably? Right. right? <laughs> yeah. But I can't tell you, I think the reason why it felt worse was because we were so disappointed in what we thought reality was going to be, that it was right. going to get better. Right. And it didn't. I mean, it was just it's never going to be back to how, you know, it was, but never is it ever. Like you're always growing and learning and changing and things. So, but um, I think that disappointment of the gap of what we thought it was going to be and what it is. And so really we're trying to think through things of, okay, if something were to come up, are we, how can we be flexible? I think we've learned a lot about flexibility. Right. We've learned a lot about um, adjusting and then, um, I mean, one of our big focuses for next year is really going to be on the well-being of our staff right. um, because, you know, we've focused so much on kids and attention on kids and what they've gone through and helping them through things. And so how do we help our staff navigate that? And that, you know, I mean, as educators, we have plans, like we plan things out and we, you know, follow that course. And it really, the plan is not the most important thing as mm -hmm. the process and thinking through the plan so that whenever you have to pivot or eh, that word, um, whenever you have to adjust that it's okay, you're ready for that. And you're not thinking the line is going to be straight. And so when there's a turn, you're so disappointed and upset about it, but there are going to be curves in that road. So how do we create a pathway but we're flexible on that pathway i think we're preparing better for that right. um than we have in the past i actually like i i i think for the first time like because everyone's saying it, it's been harder and i understand that but i don't think i really like i think i just thought yeah it's harder but i didn't really understand that you put a really great perspective is that it was like really just terror like we had higher expectations for this year mm -hmm. and it wasn't as smooth as what we wanted and you know part of that, just that kind of disappointment. And I appreciate you sharing that about um, health and wellness of staff, right? Because that's something that's been really huge for me, really improved my health over the last a while and feel like I can deal with negative stuff and issues way better than I have in the past, which is great. Like it seems to slide off me a little bit because I've taken better care of my health. Because of a teacher too is actually solely focused on the stories that we, or the, the the wisdom that we wish we could have shared with ourselves when we first started teaching. So it is very focused on the first years of teaching. It's, um, you know, I don't know if I would say it's targeted to first year teachers, because uh, anyone could read it. But you know, it is meant to be for especially for those coming into the profession, but those stories resonate, no matter where you're in your career. And that's what you wrote about. So like, if you can go back and share advice for your first year of teaching, what, what advice would you share to Sean? Three words, George, um, know your impact. And I, um, you know, there, I'm grateful for that first year. I'm grateful for the, the, the time that I had and, and I don't, you know, I don't have many horror 
teacher stories of, you know, locking myself in the closet or, you know, dr- dropping the, 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 the vase or whatever. You know, I didn't have any of those kind of, you know, kind of goofy sitcom for <laughs> your teacher moments. I was, I was really lucky. Um, but I, I was so like in my nose and, and in my, my, my kind of tunnel vision on right. lesson plans and, and survival that that I didn't really step back and and look at the fact that I'm there to to make an impact and uh, you know I, I you know just just missed opportunities and I would I would kind of say to myself I would tell that guy that 22 year old you know geek Beatles freak you know that mm-hmm. you know one know your impact and and really savor don't rush through savor the moment, savor the time that you have with your kids and, and don't be afraid to share your, your passions. And, and I, I did a lot of that stuff later and, and incorporated music and such in, in, into my classroom. But, um, you know, I, I just think there's a lot of teachable moments that I missed because I was so mm-hmm. hell bent on schedule and planning and, and, right. and following rules and, and being dutiful and, and, and then also, too, I, you know, at that time, because it was a um, I was in a volunteer teacher program. It was kind of the, the Catholic version of Teach for America. So I was in an inner city um, school in, in, in D.C. And um, I um, I just I, 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 I taught a fifth grade class. I wanted to be a high school English teacher. I wanted to be Sidney Poitier and Robin Williams right. and teach Walt Whitman and F. Scott Fitzgerald and Langston Hughes. And, you know, here I am. I felt like the curriculum was beneath me. And 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 I may have taken that out. I, I took that on to the kids. And, and right. so I uh, and I was so hell bent on on getting to high school and, and, and moving to the next level. So hmm. I, I, I lost a lot of opportunities and, and, and times to really nurture the kids. And, you know, now as I'm thinking about it, I mean, those kids, that's, that was 30 years ago. So I, my, I, I just celebrated my 30th year in education. Wow. And, and so those kids are like 40. <laughs> right. They're still, mad. They're still mad at you made them read that stuff. Yeah. So I just, I'm just having a, a senior moment here. Wow. That was, wow. That's, that's amazing. That's- yeah. And, you know, and like Sean, first of all, thanks for your vulnerability. And I think that's one of the things I loved about your writing. I loved about um, the other authors because of teacher is that, you see someone who's, you know, 30 years into the profession, who's had a, amazing opportunities, done incredible things, and it, we, we're still growing. We're still getting better. Like, there's no point. And I, like, I've always said this. Once you're, once you're done learning, then you might as well quit teaching because it's, yeah. o- it's over for you, right? And I yeah. think that um, was displayed so beautifully in your work. And um, I'm so proud to call you a friend, and I, I appreciate all you do, and I appreciate how um positive you are in the world how you lift so many people up and i know you do it in your school but i i for sure know you do it with the rest of the world because i see it on you know social media all the time 